began with bullying and intimidation. There were political cartoons depicting the Chinese as pigs and as heathens. The U.S. government even took legal action against them, and anti-Chinese violence became commonplace across the West. The Washington Territory was no exception. When the factory whistle blew on November 3, 1885, Tacoma's leaders drove the Chinese out of town. Well, it was not our finest hour as a city. The leaders of Tacoma, the mayor, the police chief, the prosecutor, basically the establishment, for the most part decided that it was time to expel the Chinese residents from our city. So they went down to the waterfront where many of them had homes, took them out of their homes, burned them to the ground, put them on trains and told them to leave our city. It was a very sad, tragic event and it's one of the reasons that Tacoma, you know, for a pretty large city on the west coast, does not have a Chinatown. In the summer of 1885, there were as many as 700 Chinese that lived in Tacoma. By year's end, they were all but gone. Today, Tacoma is an international port city with a population of more than 200,000. And yet, there are still only about 700 Chinese that live here. To understand why means exploring the history of the American West and the Chinese immigrants who were part of it. Aside from the Native Americans who had lived here for centuries, everybody was a foreigner. If you were um, a Chinese individual, you were just one of many people, and you, everybody was a, a stranger in a strange land. But the Chinese would quickly learn that in this land of opportunity, not everyone thought all immigrants were created equal. When the Chinese began moving into the United States in the 1840s, 1850s, I mean, there are lots of public debates about slavery. This idea that God had even created separate races from the very beginning, that they were unequal. You know, history is written by the victors, and in a lot of instances, that unfortunately was not the Chinese migrants that came here and helped build the West. Most of the Chinese came from the southern Chinese province of Guangdong and spoke little, if any, English. They were hired through labor contractors. They're like labor brokers, employment agents, that would contract with big businesses and corporate concerns in the United States. So they would act as the intermediary to find the Chinese workers and then bring them over to the U.S. And as part of that, it was called the credit ticket system. The Chinese would borrow some of the passage money that they would need, and then it would be paid back in portions as they worked for whatever that corporate concern was or whatever that business was. We identify coolie laborers as being something that is more affiliated with being shanghaied or stolen out of China and then put into other, other jobs or other laboring positions. So the Chinese that were shanghaied in China and taken directly to Peru, they were uh, essentially were looking at slave labor. Um, so the term itself is really not one, uh, I don't believe it's one that really accurately describes the Chinese experience in North America. What is accurate though is the vital role they played in building our railroad infrastructure. In 1862, President Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act, authorizing the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. But there was a shortage of white labor out west, so Central Pacific hired thousands of Chinese. They were incredibly hard workers. The reputation uh, with respect to hiring the Chinese was that they were not prone to strike, which automatically made them diametrically different from many other immigrant groups who were hired to work on the railroads. These were individuals that they could literally work to their death and pay them pennies for the kind of work that they did. Well, the Central Pacific was blocked by the Sierra Nevada mountains, building the railroad through these granite cliffs. And the work was so hard that it was going very slow. They had a hard time recruiting white workers. They did find white workers, but there were not enough and they often quit. They would work for a while, as I understand it, get a paycheck and, and disappear. 
and the Chinese had this reputation for working very hard. The conditions in the Sierra Nevadas proved to be so severe that the Chinese actually did stage a work stoppage. So in the spring of 1867, 2,000 of them, they were way up in the mountains. They waged a strike. They wanted equal wages with the white workers. And Central Pacific dug in their heels and Charles Crocker said, we will not give in to the Chinese and they just cut off the food supply. And the Chinese were forced to give up their, their strike. But you know, it's significant that they wanted something better and they did something about it. I think at the end of the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad, of the 13,000 working on the Western Leg, 11,000 of them were Chinese. I don't think they got much recognition at the end of that for what they did. But that's not to say the Chinese haven't been recognized at all. They have. Among other things, at the Golden Spike National Historic Site, you'll find this sign, which salutes the Chinese for laying 10 miles of track in one day during Central Pacific's final push. Organized labor kind of sold the idea of the need for national legislation because if the United States had some piece of legislation that was going to prevent the Chinese from coming in, then the incidences of violence would somehow be curtailed because the Chinese would no longer be coming into the U.S. Congress gave in and passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Chinese Exclusion Act is the very first law targeting a racially based group, restricting their immigration into the United States, and it was on the books until 1943. Chinese exclusion was really focused on preventing skilled and unskilled laborers from coming into the United States. It did allow exempt classes, so if you were a merchant, a scholar, a diplomat, you could still come into the United States. The exclusion law suddenly legitimized racism. The Chinese Exclusion Act helps to create the idea that immigration is something that needs to be policed. Basically, I think it sets the stage for this idea that there are people who are desirable and there are people who are undesirable. And there are people who can become Americans and there are people who cannot become Americans. It's basically legally sanctioned discrimination and violence towards Chinese migrants living in the West. Um, and that's when life gets really difficult for folks. And in Seattle and Tacoma, um, basically white vigilante mobs begin attacking Chinese residents. In October of 1885, Tacoma's Chinese residents were given less than one month to get out of town. The majority left, but on November 3rd, as many as 200 remained. That's when Mayor Robert Jacob Weisbach led an angry mob of whites through the streets to round them up. The action had clearly been scripted ahead of time. When that whistle went off, everybody would break from work or whatever they were doing and would, would uh, in a supposedly an orderly manner, would gather um, downtown. It was raining, it was just a crummy November day. The mob assembled in the street and just systematically moved back and forth across the city. And there were two areas where the Chinese were living. One was near the Old Town area, but there was also an area of land that was leased by the Chinese, and the land was owned by the Northern Pacific Railroad. There wasn't an intention, like a lynch mob, to necessarily do any harm to anybody, but they weren't gonna take no for an answer. They were going to basically gather up all of the Chinese who were living in Tacoma, um, transport them to a railroad station in Lakeview, which was, a, it's, that, that station was about eight miles south of uh, the, the core of Tacoma. Pretty unrelenting results. The Chinese were just brought out of their homes. In most cases, they weren't allowed to bring anything with them and they were just really literally herded. And by this time, it's night, it's cold, 
It's raining. Some of the Chinese that they took out of the Chinatown area were, were ill, and they had to wait overnight for the train to come. Those that could afford it were told to buy a ticket um, south to Portland, and uh, the others were loaded on freight cars. But not before two Chinese reportedly died from exposure during the night. No one knows exactly how many Chinese made it all the way to Oregon, but the consensus is a lot of them did. It's only in recent years that formal apologies about the treatment of Chinese in California, the treatment of the Chinese in Washington state. Um, it's, it's all in very recent years that formal apologies have even been given. And I'm gonna say not just apologies, but also recognition for the work that they did. Several U.S. cities are making efforts to recognize the Chinese and to apologize for how they were treated. Denver has placed a plaque where its anti-Chinese riot took place. Astoria has the Garden of Surging Waves, a beautiful park that celebrates the Chinese efforts to build the city. And in 2016, the people of Rock Springs dedicated a monument to the 28 Chinese miners that were murdered. But are efforts like these enough? The important question is this, how do we learn from our mistakes and how do we say to ourselves, how can we be better next time? In 2010, I actually, with the Chinese Reconciliation Foundation, led a walk of reconciliation. We basically replicated the same group that did committed this atrocious act and we walked down Pacific Avenue to Ruston Way and basically said we walked in the reverse direction, trying to really reverse the pain and the heartache that that event caused. We keep running into people that say, why bring up the bad past? You know, why bring up the, it's like, we're not talking about guilt. We are talking about a mistake that was made. We are talking about educating people so if they see symptoms of it, that it doesn't happen again. Perhaps the most impressive effort to recognize and honor the Chinese can be found in Tacoma. The Chinese Reconciliation Park is really a monument to what happened in the past, but also a signal that says it will never happen again. It sits on the waterfront and it takes place around the same area where a lot of the Chinese residents were expelled. It's a beautiful park that has a bridge showing the bridge to the future. It has a Ting, which is a building that was donated by our sister city, Fuzhou. Teresa Pan Hosley is a member of our community and she has been working on the Chinese Reconciliation Park, I would say for 20 years. A lot of what you see is a result of her hard work and her tenacity. My main goal is to right a wrong and to bring the harmony to this community. We are all different in terms of our uh, culture and our uh, upbringing. What happened back then, I think it because people did not understand Chinese culture, which is very different from uh, American culture. And I thought, you know, instead of put a plaque on, on the ground, I would like something more substantial and can bring people in, people from different community, people from all cultural background, to walk through, to learn the history. And so we together can learn from each other. He's a sojourner. Watching the Reconciliation Park become more popular, more of a destination, and to come together is really exciting. But more than anything, it sends a message about our city. We will never repeat that type of mistake because Tacoma is an international waterfront city, and all people are welcome here from wherever you are. <laughs>
Major funding for this program provided by the Russell Family Foundation. Additional support provided by the Bates Family Foundation and the Chinese Reconciliation Project Foundation and by CHI Franciscan Health and the MultiCare Health System and contributions to KBTC Public Television by viewers like you. Thank you.